focusing right now that you have two options on which you would like to focus on. If you're dealing with a challenge right now in your life, there's definitely an opportunity to focus on that problem and how you're going to solve it and how you're going to get through it. But we have another option, and that's to focus on the Lord. You know, much to what Fashad was saying was that he was able to praise because he focused on God. He lifted him up. He magnified him instead of the problem that we may be dealing with. So just a little encouragement for the message this morning is to focus on God in these times. Focus on the Lord when your heart is hurting, when you're down, when you're sad, when you're angry, when you're facing those challenges that may seem insurmountable. I challenge you to say that they're insurmountable because we're focusing and we're putting our hands on it as opposed to putting it in the hands of the Lord who will work all things out for our good. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, family. Good morning, Facebook, for those who are just joining. Uh, what a great day. Um, we're going to get right into it, guys. Uh, we're in Acts. I'm sure you all knew that. We've been going through our eyewitness study, both on our Sunday uh, morning gathering, on our Thursday Bible study, as well as in our life groups. Going through Acts first, um, first person eyewitness accounts through the book of Acts, and we're landing in Acts 15 today. So as you're grabbing your Bibles, look at Acts 15. Let's get there. I will say this, though we normally do an ESV, an English Standard Version translation, uh, just in my preparation, uh, kind of flipped through a couple of different versions to, you know, see which translation really captured what I believe the Lord is after, and that's going to be in the New Living Translation. That is the NLT, if you're on your Bible app, look for the abbreviation NLT or New Living Translation as we're going there. I'll also warn you that I'm going to be doing some reading this morning, um, 20 verses. So stay along with me. I'll try and make it interesting and we'll get to the word and get you on to brunch in your house because you can't go anywhere. Anywho, Anywho uh, Acts 15, starting at verse 1 in the New Living Translation says this, while Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. They said, unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and the elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's jo excuse me, joy, that the Gentiles too were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and the elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. And at the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. He said, Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you? now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear. That's good stuff right there. We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. We're almost there, family. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And when they had finished, James, this is the brother of Jesus, guys, stood and said, brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. 
And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. As it's written, afterward I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it, so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. And so my judgment, again, this is James, is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write them and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. <sighs> Can you say amen? That was a lot of reading, right? So just to kind of encapsulate what is going on here, uh, Barnabas and Paul, as we learned about last week, have gone on their missionary journey. Uh, they are bouncing around the region, sharing the good news, and Gentiles or non-Jewish people are coming to the Lord. They are accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior. The Lord is moving you know, miracles are happening, all of these things. And then what happens is the Pharisees, who you all may be familiar with, you know, these are the religious folk. These are the church folks of ancient times come and start in the midst of Jesus being accepted, starts propping up and moving to share about the law from which they have came from. So one of the aspects of what's happening here that we must take into consideration today is the law the law of Moses. We'll get into it. I'm not going to dive right this second. The second part is what Paul and Barnabas are kind of sharing with people. They're sharing Jesus. They're sharing the way that the Lord is moving through them by the Holy Spirit in order to save people, in order to grow the first century church. That aspect of what we're talking about today is the gospel. So we have the law, we have the gospel, and now, when we get towards the end of what I just read, all 20 verses, thank you for holding on and bearing with me, but I had to get through all of it. As we got towards the end, James, who is a uh, apostle and, you know, an elder in the church, says, okay, yes, we need to preach the gospel, but there is a handful of things that we do need to share and communicate. And so what, what I'm dubbing that, this isn't an official biblical or spiritual term, so you all forgive me for imposing my interpretation on it. You know, we have the law, we have the gospel, and then James shares a short, concise code of conduct. The law, the gospel, and the code of conduct. Now, before I get too much into this, I just want to make an obvious point and just kind of shout something out real quick. I don't believe the Pharisees of the first century church actually wanted the church to grow. I know that sounds crazy, but I'm sure of this because if there's one quick surefire way to make sure that you don't get a bunch of men to join your church is to require circumcision as a cover charge. I'm just saying, just something to make you think this week as you're going through your devotion. I don't even want to know what the ID check looked like if they're requiring circumcisions. But anyhow, the circumcision though it's a small piece of a larger, you know, uh, a larger way of thinking in the first century church was just one of the ways that the law was used by religious sects, such as the Pharisees in the early church, to try and hold on to the traditions of the law of Moses. Some other funny ways that you might, you know, come across in your reading or in your eyewitness right now media study this week, hint, hint, is trying to qualify how far you could walk on foot before it was considered a sin on the Sabbath, or the requirements wear a head covering anytime you came into the temple, or even requiring that you take a bath before you come into the temple. Now, I can't say I disagree much with that last one. Let's all smell fresh and clean for the Lord. But observing the law while having its place in our faith is in fact flawed when it's used as a qualification of salvation. For those that don't know or maybe newer to the faith, let me kind of put the law in a nutshell for you guys. There are over 600 laws mentioned in the writings of Moses. And they were generally broken down into three categories. You know, laws that were kind of self-evident, like the Ten Commandments. Hey, don't kill people. You know, don't uh, steal from people. Don't sleep with your neighbor, etc. You know, those things that are kind of like, duh, 
I know that I shouldn't be doing those things. Um, there are also laws that commemorate important events and they require certain acts to be performed like sacrifices or, you know, uh, the large uh, cooking of and killing of animals, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are laws that were decrees that is kind of this fuzzy gray area. Of, you know, a lot of them were considered irrational and hard to follow and, and, and explain. And most of them aren't in practice any, anymore today. But all of that really sounds like a recipe for disaster, if you ask me. A lot of rules and regulations designed really to mold man into an upstanding citizen in God's eyes, or probably also in, you know, the religious leader's eyes. And, you know, just to have a moment of transparency, if I'm honest, when I gave my life to Christ some years ago, I actually saw the Bible as a big rule book, you know, that behavior modification was the goal in mind and you know how do we get bad people to be good and how do i stop doing the bad things that i do and become good i mean you know i'm joining a church i gotta get myself together and so i kind of set about even in my private devotion time as a new christian to find out what i'm supposed to do as a christian and it's funny, you know, in this time that we've been at home during quarantine, and, you know, we've done some spring cleaning because let's face it, there wasn't too much else to do. So we cleaned and my wife and I came across a box of old journals and all that. And I pulled out an old journal of mine and I looked through it and I took a look at, and this is from, you know, 15 years ago, you know, what I wrote down in my journals, you know, when I'm going to Sunday uh, service or what I'm doing in Bible study and what I was studying, you know, what was I writing down? What was I taking notes on? And what I found was that it was a bunch of things that I thought that I was supposed to be doing and a lot of things that I shouldn't do anymore. And, you know, not that pastor was teaching it that way, but that was just my perception. That was my understanding of what it meant to be a Christian. I was joining a religion and I thought that there was a bunch of, you know, Pharisees around that were checking on my behavior, you know, kind of checks and, and balances, you know, is this new guy, you know, is he being a good boy, so to speak? And I had to get myself together because this is what was expected of me or so I thought. And I, you know, looking back now, it's easy to be like, well, you know, that's, that's a bunch of bull. And some of you all are probably even laughing right now. Um, like what in the world was Kevin thinking? But it forced the thought and I'll consider or I'll offer for you to consider just this moment to ponder where would I get the idea that that's what this was all about what drove me as a new believer to think that behavior modification and this checklist of requirements was what was expected of me you know what gave me an inkling that joining a church or coming into a relationship with Jesus was about rules to follow that there were some sort of pre-qualifications and also running qualifications to keep my membership intact with Jesus like continuing education credits or something and as I just started to think and just kind of like pondered upon this I just remember you know way back in the beginning my, my neighbor who I love dearly and she may even be on Facebook watching right now she used to take me to vacation Bible school I did not grow up in a, in a faith-filled family we didn't go to church on Sundays I was a heathen I'm not afraid to admit it to you all now because Jesus loves me anyway but you know she used to take me to vacation Bible school and I remember running into some of these Christian kids and I would I remember them saying things like oh we can't do that or we're gonna go to hell or you better stop doing that. You know, God is watching you. Like he's this, this, this boogeyman that's like over here somewhere and he's watching and, and you know, it's some sort of book like Santa Claus has checking whether I'm being naughty or nice. And I remember Christian adults that were kind of, I felt stuck up and, and looked down upon you because, you know, you may have been a little unruly like me as a child, a little misbehaving young boy I was. Um, and so, you know, you get that and, you know, you get the going to hell piece. And, and then I started to look and see Christians and I was like, oh, these are, these are like goody goodies. Like that, that's what Christians are. You know, they're, they're good. They're goody goodies. Not like good people, like the kind of person you like to have in your neighborhood and you want to go out and chit chat and have a beer with. These are like goody goodies, like goody two shoes, like the kind of good people that get on your nerves. Um, and so that kind of kept me away. But then when the Lord did draw me in, 
and you know i accepted jesus i was immediately like all right i gotta be a goody goody now you know i gotta do all these things right and it's wrong i saw christianity as a mechanism of controlling your behavior and not a saving relationship with the lord who honestly loved me and loves you and just wants to come back into a relationship with us you know how many times have we witness things like this you know preaching morality instead of preaching the gospel you know if, if you've ever heard someone say oh you know as soon as i get myself together i'm, I'm going to come to church then i had a dishwasher that worked for me that i invited to church one time he's like oh no 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 i'm not ready for that i need to get myself together first i need to you know clean up my act i need to start doing things a little bit differently you know chances are that you know that dishwasher and just like me had been by you know these goody goodies and these morality preachers so to speak modern day pharisees requiring circumcision and observance of the laws before anyone can be saved now you know and i know that you can't get yourself together to come to church that's why we need to come to church because that's where Jesus can meet us. He'll meet us anywhere, but that's where he begins to mold and shape and help bring us into alignment with what he is, you know, kind of predestined for our life. And I'll tell you the truth, family, I've been saved for 15 years, and I'm like, any day now, I'm going to get it together. Any day now, I'm going to stop cussing. Any day now, I'm going to stop misbehaving and being an unruly child. Any day now. It's an exercise in futility. Can you agree? Someone raise your hand and say, yes, I agree. I know what you're talking about so that I'm not out here, out here by myself. I need to let somebody off the hook this morning and allow you to internalize these statements. There is no moral requirement for you to accept salvation from the Lord. There should be no moral requirement on people who come to join the church. For you to walk in the door and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is not a checklist that you need to do in order to come. You're not going to pick up a passport. You do not need to have forms filled out, and stamp of approval, and your shots. You just need to come. Amen? So as you work on getting yourself together, and as we're all working on getting ourselves together, again, any day now, remember that. And as new people come to the church, remember that. They're coming to accept salvation. They're coming to accept the Lord's love. And we as the church need to project that on to them. Now, the Pharisees in, in this passage of Scripture, not so loving, Hey, you can come in, but, you know, you got to go see, you know, Gargamel out back. He's got a little procedure he needs to do for you. Whoa. Whoa. If you look at verse 10, as we're talking about the law and, you know, keeping the law in order to uh, have the qualification of salvation and to maintain your salvation. If you look at verse 10, Peter, this is when Peter stands up. He kind of lets the Pharisees have it. He says, so wait, why are you challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers? These are the new believers that are not Jews. Why are you challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? Peter said that. Y'all remember Peter, right? He dissed Jesus, didn't obey, tested him, rebuked him, denied him, left him at the cross. And Peter, that guy pulled the rug out from underneath the Pharisees' feet and said, y'all couldn't even keep the law. Why are you trying to make them do it? But isn't that what some church folks do? And have, you may have even done I know that in the beginning I did it. When I was on my high and mighty horse and trying to learn the do's and the don'ts, and I started to feel myself like, well, I'm doing pretty good. I'm going to start to require this and that and this and that. We expect people to live up to a standard that we even can't live up to. Because it wasn't long after that before I found myself cussing again and falling again and doing all, all the things I said that I couldn't do anymore as a believer. This is people today, their main beef with Christians in the church. Modern times, right now, we are exclusionary instead of inclusionary. We are disqualifiers, yet we ourselves are in fact not qualified to be here. Can you say amen or ouch, whatever works for you. You all remember, remember some time ago, just to kind of put this in, you know, modern perspective, that there was a small congregation in the southern United States. I'm not going to name names. You all may know who I'm talking about. 
but they would take it upon themselves to do just what these Pharisees and our scripture were doing. You know, they would pronounce the law and they would pronounce God's justice and they would pronounce all of these things. They even used to protest at the funerals of soldiers, you know, that God's justice was being, you know, enacted by the death of these because God despises war and death. So they've lost their life as a legalistic ramification of what they were doing. Or they would go outside of abortion clinics and tell all the women going inside that they were going to hell because they were killing babies. You know, they would espouse that God's justice was was being served. They embodied the law in their rhetoric and in their public facing ministry. No grace, just justice. And they developed the reputation that you would expect they would. Heartless Christians, hypocrites, hateful, I mean, you name it. But the problem is that on a larger scale, they were speaking for the church. In the people's eyes that were watching these news stories, that were horrified at what they were seeing from this small ministry in the South, as they were horrified, so we were as well. These band of heartless people professing Christ now had the media's attention and the country's attention and the world's of Christian, uh, the world's attention, and they were speaking for Christians because they professed Christianity, and now. Okay, so this is who all Christians are. And we became associated with hate, being moral zealots, but at the same time, hypocrites. As these stories kept unfolding about this small ministry, eyewitness under, you know, uh, investigative undercover reports started revealing much of probably what all of us know. Moral failures all throughout the ministry, you know, brainwashing, you know, people trying to escape and being threatened. Like, it was just crazy. But the same thing, as you're shaking your head and like in disbelief about what we're talking about with this church in modern day, the Pharisees, they're kind of doing that same thing. What the Pharisees were ultimately trying to do was hold on to a way of life and faith that was interested in controlling people more so than saving people. This was the perception I had as a new Christian. What they had built their life on was being turned upside down by the gospel because ultimately it was wrong. Now the law is the law of God. You know, the law of Moses is the word of God. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but now it's been rendered undone, so to speak, by the work of Jesus Christ. And the reason why, you know, this way of life is, you know, trying to live up to the law is futile is because we all suffer humans the human race suffers from something that brian chapel who's a professor of theology and uh, an author brian chapel said and i love the way he put it that we all suffer from the fallen man condition and the fallen man condition is just this that all men sin and fall short of the glory of god there is not one of us that has lived up to the expectation of the law and of god since the time of Adam, no one has been able to live up to the law. Mind-blowing. Why, Pharisees, why modern-day church folks, are we trying to live up to something that's impossible to meet? The fallen man condition basically states since Adam, since Adam fell in the garden, we've not been able to meet the expectations of the law. The Pharisees were trying to will their way to righteousness through discipline and through following rules. They wanted to get back in God's good graces by trying, you know, the same way that they've tried since the times of Moses when he wrote the law. And Paul, Barnabas, and Peter in our scripture, they're like, whoa, guys, you, whoa, whoa, you got it wrong. Flag on the play, time out. And they espoused it this way, and they, you know, they described it, and they said, because Jesus, as you and I know, my brothers and sisters, Jesus said that he was the only way to the Father. Not through righteousness and follow, you know, following all the laws. It's only through accepting Christ that we're able to get into. Why are we putting this condition on other people? Jesus, became, Jesus came to the earth because of man's inability to follow the law. It demonstrated the necessity of grace unconditional grace, undeserved grace, and grace that came in the form of Jesus Christ. Paul and Barnabas are out there making it happy, souls are being saved, you know, the church is growing, and here come these clowns, these Pharisees, throwing morality and law around like it's still meant something. 
The only thing that love is good for now is demonstrating the necessity of our relationship with Jesus Christ, who despite our own shortcomings and trying to follow 613 laws that Moses laid out, still loves us and wants us, who still wants us despite our inability to, once we do accept him, keep ourselves together, who still wants us despite all the wrong that we end up doing in the times that we trip and fall and fall short of his expectations for us on this side of Christ. It's a wonderful thing. We're not booted out of his church because we still fall short. Why? Because he knows who we are. He knows that it's an unfair yoke to try and wear and carry for this life. That's the gospel, guys. No requirements for salvation except to believe in order to be saved. No checklists, no nothing. No circumcision, thank you, Jesus. Nothing. So just to kind of take a quick pause, recap, before we kind of get into the last portion. We, we've talked about the law and its futility and the Pharisees, you know, law of Moses, rah, 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 gay morality, <clears throat> which is important but unrealistic. And we've talked about the gospel, the necessity of a relationship with Christ, the necessity of having someone stand in the gap for us, someone to take that sacrifice that we so deserved so that we could have that relationship with God. Because as we've seen and as Peter articulated in our scripture, living up to the law is a losing battle. It is an exercise in futility. But like much of our passage this morning, we need to acknowledge that there is, in fact, a code of conduct that we must talk about, even for the believer. Because we really can't be saved and changed by our relationship with Jesus if there is no change manifested by our salvation. Because as stated in the beginning of the message, there are three components, as we just talked about, law, gospel, code of conduct, again, Code of conduct is not the biblical term. That's just the best I can come up with to explain what it is. But it's the code of conduct is a wonderfully dynamic concept. It's not as black and white as the law. It's not as black and white as the gospel. But code of conduct is kind of this gray area where we're operating in the dispensation of grace and salvation, yet there's expectation, right? Kind of an anomaly. How do those two things fit together? And the way that we're going to learn about it is through a pretty well-known passage in scripture that I'm going to go to. We're not going to dive super deep. You're going to have to come back to Bible study on Thursday for us to do the deep dive on it, but I am going to start talking about it a little bit. <clears throat> it's really rooted in a story of a group of religious zealots, adultery, stoning, potentially, and the intervention of one amazing man. Um, like I said, we're going to go deeper on Thursday, but just so you don't think I'm talking off the cuff, in John 8, just write that down, John 8. This is the story of the woman caught in adultery. You can, can wave your hand and nod your head if you know what I'm talking about. It's a very well-known uh, passage in scripture. <clears throat> I'm gonna go through it really quickly just to start to discuss and kind of lay the foundation for what's gonna be discussed Thursday in Bible study. Right back here, same time, same place, not same time. That would be wrong. Thursday, 7 p.m., amen. But John 8 and verse three, it starts this way. As he was speaking, this is Jesus, the teachers of religious law and Pharisees and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Here they go again. Pharisees running around, trying to catch up with people, trying to catch people doing wrong, moral gunslingers. Here they go again. They brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery and they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. Listen, the law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Let's stop for a second. Here we go again. Law of Moses, what they espouse, moral gunslingers. The law of Moses set out a number of offenses that are punishable by stoning. You all know what stoning is. They throw you down in a pit and they throw these head-sized boulders on you until you succumb, until you're all done, until you die. Um, so what the law is illustrating here, and I'm trying not to get too technical, 
and you all know this if you've been around our pastor Alan Gray for any moment of time, the wages of sin are death. That is what the law of Moses states. We sin, we die. Here, we're talking about it physically, but in a spiritual sense, death is a separation from the Lord. So what they're doing now is trying to enact the law of Moses, and they want to see what he says, you know, is the law of Moses still being upheld? So they ask him, well, what do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. This is in verse 6. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. No one knows what he really wrote. I want to say that he wrote kick rocks. It seems apropos. I can't prove it biblically, but it seems like a good thing to say. Kick rocks, they have boulders, there's a lot of dirt around. Anyway, he wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, it says. So he stood up again and said, all right, look, y'all want to stone this woman? No worries. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. So the wonderful dynamic here is that even though this happened years and years and years, decades, I believe, even before the church and, you know, this whole Acts 15 that we're going through today, that this is being tested even now. You know, Jesus is laying the foundation for what later uh, James, or excuse me, Peter would end up saying to all of the Pharisees. It's like, you yourself can't even hold on to the law. Why are we enacting it on these people? Jesus is saying the same thing right here. Hey, no worries. Let's enact the law. But only the one who's never sinned is able to throw the stone. You can't participate in this unless you yourself have held this up. You can't be a hypocrite and be in the church. So then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. I want to say he wrote something like, drop the mic or get out my face. I can't prove it again spiritually. Y'all pray for me. But listen. Verse 9 said, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one. I love the visual. Picture this. A bunch of people around this woman. They've got her in front of the crowd. Everybody's got their rocks ready to go. There's kids. There's everybody. Everybody's around. Jesus says, drops a bomb on them. Unless you are without sin, you cannot participate in this. Have you all seen the, the meme or the gif where Homer Simpson like kind of like slowly backs out of the screen and goes through the bushes to avoid a, an awkward situation. That's just what I see right here. I just see all these people just slowly backing away like, man, Jesus, Urgh, he got me again. And it says that it started with the oldest person. <coughs> Excuse me. It said it started with the oldest person. They began to slip away. And it's like, these old dudes knew that they were no good. So they just started to slip away. But then it said until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd, with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again after he wrote, get out my face in the dirt and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? He said, or she said, no, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I. So up to this point, up to this point, we've seen the attempt of the Pharisees within this story not just in Acts, but in John 8 here, we've seen the attempt of the Pharisees to enact the law on someone. And we have seen a physical representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ in that he stepped in and saved this woman from death. He stepped in, and by all accounts, according to the law of Moses, she deserved to get stoned. Just as we deserve the death that we deserve for being out of relationship with God. Jesus stepped in as a physical stop point, a physical manifestation of the gospel, even before his work was completed on the earth and excused her and covered her and saved her from the penalty of her sin. I know you all have probably heard this a million times, but just stick with me as I come down the home stretch and close right here. So this woman has been saved. She has accepted the salvation of Jesus Christ. Not the way that we do, but in the fact that he literally saved her life, physically. And she said, no one's condemning me, Lord. And he said, neither do I. But the inkling that there is something expected of us after salvation is right in these next five words. Jesus says to the woman, go and sin no more. Okay, Kevin, how do you go through this whole thing 
talking about the law thrown out the window because of the salvation of Jesus and then wrap it up and finish it up with talking about a code of conduct, something that is required of the believer. But there is, in fact, a code of conduct, family. But the focus isn't on what you should be doing as a Christian. As I kind of alluded to at the beginning when I gave my little testimony and talked about how I thought it was a bunch of do's and don'ts to come to Christianity. The code of conduct isn't based in that. Rather, it's a focus on who we should be. Not on what we should be doing, but on who we should be and who we should be coming. And it comes from, honestly, just to keep it in real simple terms, and he talked about this in verse 9 in Acts 15, Peter said, it comes from a cleansing and a changing of our hearts. It said he made no distinction between us and them, that's Jew or Gentile, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. That is what the code of conduct is based on. What is expected of believers is a changing of our heart. What's expected of believers is to become brand new, not to be the same person that we always were. We always were when we were doing wrong and when we still do wrong. It's not that. It is a changing of the heart to change who we are from the inside out. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And when we encounter Jesus and come into relationship with him, he is to change our heart. So the cliffhanger here, and I apologize, yet I don't apologize. I've worn on you probably well past my time. What is the code of conduct and how do we change the heart? That, my friends, is for Thursday night. We don't have time to get into it right now, but I pray there's been enough that has been espoused. There's been enough that has been shared. The Lord shared enough through this word in order to at least prick your heart because most of the people I'm looking at on the Zoom screen, we're all saved. Amen. We, we, we've already had that, you know, substitutionary kind of covering and salvation with Jesus. Some of you on Facebook are watching right now. Maybe not so. No worries. I, w I hope there's been enough that the Lord has shared to allow us to at least be curious about this changing of heart and this code of conduct, so to speak, which is entirely different from the law, entirely different, you know, from what they were espousing the Pharisees in the beginning for being those moral gunslingers. This is something completely different because the code of conduct is a result of the gospel. It is a result of coming into a relationship with Jesus. So with that, I just want to say a quick prayer. I encourage you all to come back and do two things. One, share the video. Three things. Share this video as our pastor has uh, encouraged you to do. Come back on Thursday, 7 p.m., same place on Facebook. And finally, to watch the eyewitness for this week. It's session 10 with James as the character, but this story in Acts is in the eyewitness. And this is what you're going to be discussing uh, on your life group call this week. Amen. So let's pray real quick, and I'm going to turn it back over to you, Pastor. Let's look to the Lord. Father, thank you first for being with us during this time, for giving us your word as, as these guardrails, as these checkpoints, as these points of reference, Lord, so that we don't become overwhelmed by the law, so that we understand the gospel, and so that we can learn about the code of conduct that's expected of us, your children. Father, we're so grateful that you chose us to be in your family, that you sent your son Jesus to die for us to sacrifice himself so that we might be in relationship with you. God, we just want you to know that we love you. And as children who love their father, we want to learn more about what you expect of us. Father, thank you for your saving grace. But show us now how we might walk in a manner worthy of the call that we have received. First as your children, God, but also as the carriers of this word in the earth. Father, be with us as we Go back to our private time of sharing. Be with those who are watching on Facebook or YouTube or watching this on replay. 
I pray for their hearts. I pray for what is troubling them. And I pray that they come to know you better as a result of whatever they're experiencing, because you work all things for our good. Father, this is my prayer as we close out today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Pastor. Amen, amen, and amen. What an amazing word and what a challenge to us. So we thank uh, and bless Kevin for um, his willingness to surrender to the Holy Spirit to be used. Um, code of conduct. It's not about what we do, but it's who we be. Praise God. Well, we're now in that portion of our service where we get the opportunity to worship through giving. My challenge to each and every person here is that you pray about what it is that God um, would have you to do in order to further the work of Christ through your efforts. Um, so giving is an opportunity to worship God um, by sharing with him a portion of that which he has given unto us. And as we prepare ourselves um, to share our screen so that for those of you all that don't know how um, you can worship through giving here with New Vision, um, you may be able to be instructed in order to do so. Let me also just say and remind um, some of us um, of the things that God has done and is doing with us. We're well on our way uh, with our special giving goal. Um, and I wanna thank those of you um, that uh, gave additional sacrificially um, so that we might be able to get to this effort. Uh, let me um, appeal to everyone again, just in case you missed the appeal um, about two weeks ago. Um, as you well know, we are in the midst of um, a digital connection um, through the word of God. Um, and it doesn't look like we're getting ready to shift out of that anytime soon. So with that being said, so that we can properly minister um, what it is that God has laid on our heart, well, not just now, but going forward, um, we need an upgrade. We need the technological and a social media upgrade. Um, so I am appealing to those of you all out there um, to help us in this effort. The appeal uh, two weeks ago is still the same. It's a $2,200 appeal that that's over and above what we traditionally give. And, and the Lord laid on my heart this morning that I believe that God is gonna bless someone supernaturally. And I wanna to touch and agree with you that you will have an overflow to be able to touch and agree um, and sow that seed with us. So I'm praying right now that if you have the faith to believe that God could allow you to be the vessel in which could be used for this effort. I want to stretch my faith towards you in an effort to make that effort happen. Um, the reason why I believe that God laid it on my heart that it was someone as opposed to just us collectively is because I believe that there's someone who needs this kind of faith stretching moment um, when it comes to your finances. God is not poor. <laughs> he has no need of financial resources. So when we go through highs and lows and um, challenging times when it comes to our finances, it's because he's teaching us something about the way he supplies our need. So I'm telling and agree with whomever that person might be. Um, if you are he or she, then may God richly bless you over and above what it is that you might desire to sow in this particular effort. And may the overflow be what comes in to the, the, the reciprocity. May that be the reciprocity that comes into the ministry. All right, with that being said, um, if you have your giving prepared, let's pray, let's bless that seed, um, and then we'll get ready for our takeaways. Eternal God, our Father, how we love you, and we thank you for the privilege, the honor, and the joy that is ours to be able to sow into your kingdom. We pray right now that even though these seeds may be leaving our hands, we're believing by faith that it has not left our life. You said bread cast upon the waters returns after many days. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men pour into your lap. So God, we thank you right now for the abundant return that's coming into our lives for every seed that we sowed. And we pray, God, that you give us wisdom for how to manage the seeds that remain. Thank you, God, in advance for what it is that you're about to do. May you be glorified in it all. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen.
Well, family, it's now time for us to just discuss for maybe two, three minutes tops our takeaways. What is it that you heard the Lord say to you during our time of worship through the word that you are going to be intentional about applying into your life this week? We don't want to just simply be hearers of the word. We want to go out and be doers of the word. And by doing the word, it just simply means applying that which we have received freely that we get. Now, freely are we expected to give. So there's somebody out there in your life, your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, your coworkers, um, that needs the gospel, the good news of what you have taken away from today. So if that's you, um, would you mind sharing a takeaway with us before uh, we say goodbye to our family um, on social media? Lisa, I think I see your hand. If that is true, then the floor, my dear, is yours. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, um, the word was so timely. Um, we can, well, people, especially people that are, are coming to Christ or trying to learn about Christ, can kind of get a little bound with how sometimes they are approached. Um, and I still base that more around denominational, that we, uh, you know, it's a certain group that really <clears throat> just drops in. in. Um, but even as um, you are speaking, I'm getting a text from my son that's just saying that his, his mind will overload. Um, he's overthinking and um, he's a go-getter. I mean, he have a car business. He 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 got he want a truck business. He want a lawn business. He's twenty five, but he has such a big mind. I try to help him bring that in, and I'm believing God that once I get off this call, that I can give him somewhere to try to calm his mind um, as it pertains to that. Um, and then I have a nephew. Um, he had got on our call last week. Um, he lost his job. He had two daughters. He lives somewhere in a part of North Carolina that. Just like Dar talked about it in a, a car or train or nothing that can get anywhere. Um, and he literally called me and just said, if it wasn't for my girls, I'd kill myself. So right now, I'm just asking for prayers for our young men. Um, they're tolling and they're trying to survive and they're trying to get through life and they're, they're raising their children. You know, the misnomer is that, oh, they just know. The men that are around me, they love their kids, they raise their children, but they do have these challenges. So. I'm just believing God that he will give me a word to give to them um, during this time, you know, that uh, they may learn to grow, you know, that it is really important to really get into the things of God. And heaven said that, um, I'm just so grateful to God that he, I have been finally released when we did go away. Um, I started writing my piece. Um, and I'm just believing God. Every it's like every day He just showed me more to just put to that piece that I will be able to put this piece out to help people that are struggling with their mind, because that is definitely where the devil desires to grow. So um, again, just prayers for my sons, all of my sons, and prayers for my nephew right now, as an enemy desires to just sift them as wheat. Thank you. Praise God. I'll I'll hop in there and and pray actually. Um, you know, I think one of the greatest things that we can understand, you know, we can even take it from uh, our word today, Lisa, is that though there's so much expected of us, whether you're a man, woman, you know, child, there are so many expectations that are on us at all times. And it sounds like your son is one of those guys that's really tough on himself and he expects a lot of himself. The important thing to note is that God doesn't expect anything from us in order to love us and if we can start there as a kind of foundation and see our life through that lens it may help and you know i'm not i'm not an, an expert by any stretch of the means it may help shoulder some of those burdens that he feels and also you feel in this moment right now for him and for your the rest of your family um because when we know at the bottom of our life or, you know, at the base of our life that God loves us and that he gave himself for us and, and all of those things. Even if I'm getting the other stuff wrong, that's taken care of and that can help filter up. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to pray real quick, Pastor, and I'll turn, turn right back over to you. Father, we love you first for loving us 
just as we shared in the message this morning, God, all you require is faith of us and belief in order to come into our lives. God, so if we're able to look at our life through that lens, Lord, give us the strength to handle everything else. God, help us base our daily existence in you and the word that you've given for us and the Holy Spirit so that we might thrive in all of the other areas just as we thrive with you. Father, I want to pray specifically for Lisa and those who she feels burdened for and that she feels compelled to pray for and to be in connection with her frank list, Lord. God, I just pray that the faith that you've endowed this woman of God with permeates through her and serves as the Holy Spirit evangelizing those on her frank list, those who she loves, her friends and family, God, that they might come to know you and in turn have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Calm their minds. Allow them to take this one step at a time, and that first step is with you. Father, thank you so much that you sent Jesus for us, for Lisa, for her family, for Derek and his daughter and the entire situation that they're dealing with. God, we know that you do all things perfectly and wonderfully. Be with them now, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, uh, uh, Lisa, for sharing, and thank you, Kevin, um, for praying. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more uh, when it comes to takeaways. Tyrell, hey there, buddy. Hey, good morning, family. Um, uh, one takeaway that I had from uh, from today's message with Kevin was um, in the in the acronym of uh, the pastor asked us to do as far as blessing our friend. The last S is share our story, um, or serve or share our story. Um, I like how Kevin shared his story and he, you know, Kevin is always transparent, but um, of how initially he looked at the Bible as a, as a rule book. Um, I, I think a lot of new believers and I know myself, it was a little bit daunting thinking that I had to um, reframe my life into a certain box that was considered a Christian. And um, like Kevin said, it's, it's a, refine, a refining process daily. Um, dying, to, dying to yourself daily, as Pastor said before, and just, um, you know, everyone, just, you know, just knowing that, just knowing that even Christians who've been Christians longer than I have are still, you know, refining themselves is a good thing uh, to know, to keep yourself, um, you, know, in, you know, in the fight, I guess you could say. But Kevin's transparency is uh, one of the things I took away. Um, and, and everyone just keep that in mind, you know, as far as, you know, just sharing your story. Um, you got to share it in the right moment, um, you know, connect with people first and then share your story. And then that will help a new believer say, okay, I'm this way. This person that I'm connected with is that, was that way as well. They didn't, they thought that the Bible was a, a rule book or a set of standards that they could live up to. Uh, they sin so much that they, there's no coming back for them. And, um, you know, it, again, you know, that's the reason I love our church, you know, the transparency of, of the elders, of our pastor, our first lady. And, and so I, I appreciate uh, the message that Kevin served today. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and, and what a wonderful um, takeaway, because as we're able to personalize um, how we receive it, um, it'll affect, it will ultimately, of course, affect what we ultimately give out for others to be able to receive them as well. Well, family, we're getting ready to come off of our, our live feed. And before we do, uh, we do want to make sure that uh, you know how to get in touch with us. Um, if this has been a blessing to you, then we challenge you uh, to, to let us know. So then that way we can continue uh, to, to work in the right directions. If there's something you would like to see or something you want to know, let us know that too, so then that way we can make sure we are ministering relevantly. Uh, we do want to make sure that we're always a proper representation of Christ in the earth, but that
also requires um, that we're giving you what it is that you need to know and hear in the process. You can comment here in the comment thread or you can email us at info at nbklc.org. As Kevin already alluded, uh, you can join us this coming Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, right here on this very same platform. And then again next week, this same time, 9.30 uh, a.m. on the East Coast um, is where we go live. If you'd like to be able to participate with our local congregation, be a part of the Zoom feed where you're able to see people on the screen and we can see you and interact because we have a different chat feature or an additional chat feature in our Zoom feed that allows us to communicate with one another. We do praise reports and prayer requests there um, as well. If you'd like to be a part of that, then just simply hit one of those to um, connection points and we'll be sure and glad to be able to join you on it. Uh, let's get ready to give our benediction and then I'm going to um, disconnect from our social media feed, talk to our local crew um, before we close on out. Eternal God, our Father, how we love you. How we thank you um, for Jesus. That uh, even though the law was given to us through Moses, um, as Kevin told us, the law was simply given to show us how much we need Jesus. So Father, right now I pray for everyone whose ears heard, whose minds are contemplating, and whose hearts were pricked to be able to draw closer to you because they recognize that there's no way they can go through this life without you. Allow us to continue to be the kind of conduit that you can use in order to reach the people that you desire to reach. Allow us to be your hands and your feet. We've come to this space to worship. And now we leave to serve, leaving this platform, but never your presence. For it's in the name of Jesus. And we all say, amen. All right, Facebook, love you guys. See you next time. All right, all right, all right.